Hello, you lucky people. After watching sort of an intro into the Civil War and uh, then kind of backtracking onto our textbook there uh, about 1857 up to 1860, uh, we talked about the election of Abraham Lincoln and how that set off a chain of secession in the South led by uh, South Carolina there in uh, December of 1860. There are going to be 11 states by April of 1861 that had joined the Confederacy. So at the close of that last video, we took a look at Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address made there in March of 1861. And in that speech, while he vehemently defends the right of the federal government and all the powers granted to it by the Constitution, Abraham Lincoln still offers an olive branch to the South. Uh, he talks about the angels of our better nature. Well, uh, less than a month after his inaugural address, by April of 1861, 11 states had joined the Confederacy. Uh, they're going to choose Jefferson Davis from Mississippi as their president. Uh, Jefferson Davis is a pretty interesting fellow. During the Mexican-American War, he served as the Secretary of War. Uh, he was a politician uh, that was very similar to Abraham Lincoln in the sense that they were both born to similar socioeconomic circumstances there in Kentucky and they were both born in 1809 and they grew up about a uh, hundred or so miles away from each other. As I tend to say on this video series for a lot of different reasons Jefferson Davis winds up becoming the president of the Confederacy. Uh, the Confederate States of America, the CSA, are going to choose the Virginian city of Richmond as their capital for the new nation. Richmond is located very close to Washington DC. In fact, that's going to play a major factor in this war. Before we really talk anything about that, let's go ahead and discuss Charleston, South Carolina. Now, South Carolina had led the way towards secession. Uh, they threatened it in 1831 under Andrew Jackson's administration. So here we are in 1861, 30 years later, uh, and Charleston's playing uh, a huge role in what's going to happen. Charleston is the South's biggest port, so you kind of have to understand that Charleston, South Carolina, could have been a lot like New York City. It has all the makings of a large harbor. Uh, it was guarded by Fort Sumter. Uh, this is a large structure that controls the entrance in and out of Charleston's harbor. In a lot of ways, it's sort of like Fort McHenry when we talk about Baltimore back in the War of 1812. In April of 1861, the fort is commanded by Major Robert Anderson. Uh, he is a officer there in the U.S. Army, and he's running out of supplies, trapped out there in the middle of Charleston's Harbor. When he's asked by the Confederates to leave or to surrender the fort, Anderson refuses. So what we're going to see in this first clip is the firing on Fort Sumter by Confederate forces here in April of 1861. This is going to be the official start of the American Civil War. Um, there's some very interesting things that happen um, at a personal level within this whole thing that Ken Burns lays out very well. And so while I really don't want to replay all of Ken Burns' top 10 hits here uh, with my coverage of the Civil War, uh, notice how Ken Burns sets up the shots, how he uses historical photography, how he uses narration, um, how he uses primary sources, um, as well as, you know, the music to set the mood. So let's take a look at that. The Civil War began at 4.30 a.m. on the 12th of April, 1861. General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard ordered his Confederate gunners to open fire on Fort Sumter. At that hour, only a dark shape out in Charleston Harbor. Confederate Commander Beauregard was a gunner, so skilled as an artillery student at West Point that his instructor kept him on as an assistant for another year. That instructor was Major Robert Anderson, Union commander inside Fort Sumter. All the pent-up hatred of the past months and years is voiced in the thunder of these cannon, and the people seem almost beside themselves in the exaltation of a freedom they deem already won. The signal to fire the first shot was given by a civilian, Edmund Ruffin, a Virginia farmer and editor, who had preached secession for 20 years. Of course, he said, I was delighted to perform the service. 
34 hours later, a white flag over the fort ended the bombardment. The only casualty had been a Confederate horse. It was a bloodless opening to the bloodiest war in American history. The first gun that was fired at Fort Sumter sounded the death knell of slavery. They who fired it were the greatest practical abolitionists this nation has produced. April 13th. So civil war is inaugurated at last. God defend the right. So immediately following the bombardment and surrender of Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, Lincoln is going to issue a call for volunteers to serve a 90-day enlistment. The U.S. military in peacetime has traditionally always been very small. In fact, when the Civil War begins, there are only 16,000 regular Army soldiers in the U.S. military. Many of their officers, their, their leaders, had Confederate sympathies. In fact, uh, one man by the name of Robert E. Lee is going to be offered command of the federal forces of the United States, the, what's going to become the Union Army. Um, this gentleman, Robert E. Lee, will refuse command and will then side with his home state of Virginia, uh, citing that he could not raise arms against his family. What Lincoln's basically doing with this call for 90-day volunteers uh, is very similar to the old militia service that we've talked about numerous times in class. Uh, these are going to be men from all the same geographic locations. Uh, they're going to know each other. They're going to be bound by uh, a lot of social obligations within that. Uh, how they're going to be, you know, part-time military. And everybody that's in the professional military knows that it's going to take a while to train these guys to get everyone up to the grade of what we would call you know a military professional um, so we're just looking at some pictures here uh, this is Knoxville Tennessee uh, Knoxville Tennessee or the state of Tennessee is really pretty interesting it is a border state yet it it yet its legislature sided with the Confederacy um, there's going to be recruitment and this is from Knoxville and what you see here in the foreground that means right up close to us where we see the artist perspective uh, we're going to see people rallying to the Union flag, to the United States, to be sworn in uh, as members of the volunteer company or the volunteer service that's going to take place. Uh, just down the street, I mean, you know, less than probably 200, 300 yards away, we see this flag. Uh, it's going to be called the Stars and Bars. Um, it's going to represent the Confederate States of America for about the first two and a half, three years of the war. Um, it's sort of a forgotten flag. Uh, in terms of you know its identification with the South. Uh, of course, there's a whole another completely different conversation about the Confederate battle flag and its symbolism. But, but what we want to understand is that this war is essentially going to be um, brother against brother, neighborhood against neighborhood. Some Union volunteers here. In fact, uh, the identifying caption says that there are five Union soldiers of Company D, the 13th Vermont. One of the things that sticks out in our minds about the American Civil War is this idea of the blue and the gray. The blue representing the Union forces, the gray representing the Confederate. And this is an idealized identification chart for the types of officers and enlisted men that you're going to encounter uh, in both armies. Uh, you can see there that everybody's wearing gray and everybody's wearing you know, blue. And Confederates here are always going to be identified by uh, yellow representing the cavalry and red representing the artillery. Um, but, you know, if, if there was ever a complete Confederate unit that was um, outfitted and dressed like this, it'd, it'd be pretty rare. What we see from the photographs uh, is a, a pretty interesting version of uniformity and fashion of 1861. Uh, these guys that are all joining up, whether they be three brothers uh, from Georgia or three brothers from Ohio. No matter where these guys are from, they're all getting their likeness taken by that wonderful new technology called the camera. Uh, 
by this time in history, 1861, uh, photography is becoming a pretty exact science. Uh, you have to remember these guys are all developing these photographs off of glass negatives uh, using various chemicals. Uh, they're doing all their development work by themselves. Uh, so the detail that you're going to see in these photographs really is dependent upon light, um, but it's also dependent upon the skills of uh, who's developing it, who's actually taking it and making a, a print off of it. A lot of these guys, I mean, you look at their faces and, you know, some of them have facial hair and some of them might appear to be uh, older to you guys because you're in middle school. Uh, these guys are all really pretty young. You get a sense of their physicality, how tall they were, maybe how much they weighed. Um, everybody's fairly slim. Um, the average height of most people that served in the Civil War, somewhere around like 5'7 to 5'9. They may have only weighed like 140 pounds. Um, it's pretty interesting to think that, you know, today it's like average American male is like 5'11, 5, five, you know, it's like me um, and, and overweight as well. Um, but these guys, you know, there are a, a lot of different characters here. I'm going to pick on everybody's mom here for a second, and I, I don't mean any personal offense to it, okay? So what's interesting about this caption here, it says, Jeff Davis and the South. Um, it's going to kind of be one of those banners that families put around um, their, their family portrait or their selfie or whatever it is on Facebook. Uh, you're going to see, you know, Jeff Davis in the South. You're going to see this banner repeated in multiple photographs that were taken in multiple studios across the Confederacy. I mean, this is like the Facebook profile picture frame for 1861, or at least the spring of 1861. I mean, every guy out there is getting his picture taken with his Bowie knife and his rifle or his musket or whatever he uses to hunt animals on the farm, um, you know, posing there next to Jeff Davis and the South. A lot of these guys are going to wear uniforms that were privately tailored. Um, they might match, you know, the guy next door or the guy down the street that's joining the regiment, but they're not obviously standard army issue. Uh, but you're going to see a lot of this. Another fascinating picture from this time uh, shows us four Virginians. And these guys here are, are, are posed with their slaves. Uh, the African-American gentleman there in the background, the two of them, well, slavery is called a peculiar institution. And there's this sort of idea that these guys that are accompanying uh, their masters to the Civil War are essentially part of their master's family. Um, does that mean they have the same rights or agency? Absolutely not. And therein lies the rub of slavery. But these guys are essentially considered part of the crew, part of the, the family that's um, up there serving their, their country at that point. In our intro for the Civil War, I mentioned some historians. Uh, the, the, the big name that comes to mind is James M. McPherson, and he studied a great number of primary sources for the conflict. The books, What They Fought For and Cause and Comrades, are going to explore the motivation of Union and Confederate soldiers. Um, there's a lot of fascinating details within both of these books, and I can't stress enough to maybe down the road try to grab a copy of, of those books and, and, and read them. Um, very rarely did soldiers mention slavery in their journals, their diaries, their letters, those things that we call primary sources. Uh, when, Southern, when Southern soldiers talked about the war, they generally believed that they were following in the footsteps of their revolutionary forefathers, uh, those who were rebelling against a tyrannical British government. Uh, Northerners were fighting for the idea of preserving the Union. Um, the South is going to call the Civil War the War of Northern Aggression. And the North uh, is going to refer to it for a long time. In fact, I would argue that within like the first generation of uh, the time period following the Civil War, uh, the North is going to refer to the Civil War as the War of the Rebellion. So, the War of the Rebellion. Sounds like something out of Star Wars, doesn't it? Well, um, getting back into uh, sort of the, the idea of these photographs, it's absolutely fascinating that these guys you know, chose, out of all things, to include in their photo to mom or dad, um, their violins. Um, these guys here at camp, these are Confederate soldiers. You'll notice that these guys are wearing uh, flannel shirts that they would have worn in civilian life, while some of these guys to the left of the frame, 
uh, seem like they have some standard issue Confederate uniforms. We have a couple of Northerners here camped out with their hardtack and their coffee. Uh, you'll see a little bit of that in the text about what the soldiers ate, and I'm going to talk more about it extensively later. Um, another thing I might get into, and I might decide not to, is the idea of military organization. I don't want to go into this too much at all, um, but you kind of have to see here in this graphic that when we talk about the Civil War, we're going to talk about uh, different groups of soldiers, groups, groups of men, and how they're organized, and who's in control of this particular group of men. Well, a regiment, uh, today we would call regiments battalions, but a regiment in the Civil War only has about 800 guys. It's commanded by a colonel. Um, my great-great-grandfather, Dan Carlin, was in the 107th Illinois Volunteer Regiment. Now, that volunteer regiment, to my reading, never numbers 800 guys, uh, but they're going to be part of a larger division, and wherever that division goes, then the regiment's going to follow. So, looking at after, you know, regiments, you've got this thing called a brigade. Now, this is going to be led by a brigadier general. Uh, a brigadier general is the lowest ranking general, uh, at least during the Civil War, and there are going to be like two to five regiments in a brigade. So there's going to be about 2,600 soldiers there. That's going to form a division, which is going to be commanded by a major general. Um, you're going to hear divisions a lot uh, when you get into the Civil War, particularly at these big battles like uh, Chancellorsville and Gettysburg and, and, and all the others. You know, there's the divisions, a pretty big, big group. And even today, uh, a division's going to number, you know, ideally a division numbers 10,000 men, all right? But you hear, you hear of divisions today. Um, there's the 1st Infantry Division, uh, it's called 1ID. Uh, there's the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, the 101st Airborne Division. And divisions are what we identify a lot of groups of, of soldiers today. Uh, well, there's this idea of a corps. Um, this is going to be made up of lots of divisions. Uh, you're going to hear about, you know, First Corps, Second Corps, Third Corps. Um, there's a lot of different corps. I mean, it, it goes up, I think, like even to the 20s um, when all this stuff is said and done. The idea is it falls into armies. That's kind of the general thing you need to keep straight. If you're reading about the Union Army, and we're talking about the Union Army around Washington, D.C. and Richmond, well, that Union Army is going to be called the Army of the Potomac. If we're talking about a Union Army that's in the Western Theater, so over by Tennessee into Georgia, uh, that army is going to be called either the Army of the Tennessee or the Army of the Cumberland. Um, the Confederates, they'll name their armies after states. you got to kind of keep that in your mind there with states and, and, and federalism, right? Well, the army that will face off in the East against the Union Army of the Potomac is going to be called the Army of Northern Virginia. And I say that with kind of a joke, but the Army of Northern Virginia is going to be the Confederate adversary for the Army of the Potomac. So I don't want, like I said, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole there. But you've got this idea of an infantry regiment, what they look like. Uh, this is, of course, back to the idea of like you know, 800 guys, in theory, that are all being led onto the field. Uh, you'll see in the, the little schematic here, the graphic, uh, that they're going to have field musicians. So drummers and guys that play trumpet and flute. Uh, there's going to be, you know, companies in reserve. The idea that there's people to back up, you know, this firing line. And, and you see that it's the right wing and the left wing. And you're going to say to me, well, Mr. Walsh, the left wing is on my right and the right wing is on my left. Uh, well, you have to remember that's from the perspective of wherever the colonel is. Whenever you start reading about the Civil War, you'll, you'll run into this crap of like, Lee was attacked on his right, um, you know, and, and it'll, you know, the converse statement of that will be, you know, uh, General Grant moved from his left. So regardless of whether they identified as a regiment or a brigade or a division, uh, this is some more pictures here looking at uh, the various enlistments of 1861. This is Corporal Francis E. Brownell, who is from Louisiana. We see this very fascinating, very Victorian, very idealized uh, depiction of the 7th Regiment of New York departing for a war in the South, heading down to Washington, D.C., and, and the crowds of onlookers and all the flags there and, and the buildings that you know, are about as tall as brick construction can get you in 1861. 
There's sort of an emotional side to all of this. You have to remember that photography, as we mentioned before, was a relatively new and um, modern art form. Um, photographers were businessmen, so they followed the army. They set up their studios right next to camp. Um, there are a number of photographs that are listed you know, in the National Archives that were preserved, um, but were never claimed by the people who had their photographs made. I mean, you think you go to the studio, you're going to sit down for a portrait. Um, developing that print is going to take a while. It's going to take several days. It might even take several weeks. Well, uh, these archives here show us uh, portraits of Union soldiers that never came to pick up their copy. So whether or not these guys had forgotten about it, whether they were killed in action or wounded, um, they just never came for their portraits. So, um, you know, it was a, a way that photographers made money off of the war, and it's a way that history winds up being recorded to us. Uh, this final picture there, uh, this is of Private Sam Watkins of Company H, the 1st Tennessee. Now, you remember here just a few minutes ago that Tennessee is going to, for all practical purposes, be considered a Confederate state. Um, but Sam Watkins wrote a lot about the war, both during it and after, and a lot of his stuff sort of forms the primary foundation of Ken Burns' Civil War. And a pretty powerful quote here by Sam Watkins. The die was cast, war was declared, every person almost was eager for the war, and we were all afraid it would be over and we would not be in the fight. The idea of going to fight for your country, whether that be the Confederate States of America or the United States, when it comes down to what's worth dying for, you know, I've asked that question a few times to you guys when we've talked about the American Revolution and some other historical events. The fact that so many people were willing to take up arms against others who lived within a pretty close geographic proximity to them, um, you know, not only just within the United States, but just um, even, you know, neighbors next door when we talk about the border states. Um, you'll notice that, you know, Virginia is a state that looks a lot bigger in its past than it does in its present, and that's because of West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia wasn't necessarily um, abolitionist country. Um, the people there, I mean, there, there wasn't a lot of slavery that existed up in the mountains simply because of economics. Um, but these people are going to leave Virginia so that they can stay in the Union, so that they can remain in the United States. Uh, this political cartoon, the caption there, Annihilation to Traitors, shows you know, the federal government, shows the eagle uh, standing over its nest, which is made up of the American flag, and all the various states that are rebelling against the Union, all of them coming out of their eggs there, and looks like we have some rats down there and, and uh, other vermin holding uh, the Confederate States flag. Uh, so let's talk for a minute here just about how one-sided this whole conflict is going to become. The Union has several distinct advantages over the Confederacy. Uh, this map right here shows us the railroads that are in service throughout the United States in 1861. Uh, you'll notice right across where the caption says Washington, D.C., across the state of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and into Illinois. Well, there's a lot of railroads that are going to run north to south, and you can see uh, up around Lake Michigan how Chicago is very quickly becoming one of America's railroad hubs. Well, the Union is going to have the ability to move armies east to west, both dealing with Kentucky and Tennessee, but then also across the Appalachian Mountains to guard Washington and to quite possibly launch an attack on Richmond. The South doesn't have those advantages. The South, if you can see there on the map, only has two railroads that are going to run east to west. Texas, which is a, a huge geographic area and there's a lot of farmland and a lot of opportunities to, to gather supplies, Texas isn't even connected to the Confederacy. In fact, the railroads here between Louisiana and Mississippi, those railroads there in Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, those tend to follow the course of the Mississippi River. More stuff about materials. Well, the North has a huge advantage in terms of railroads. This is a graphic from the American Heritage book that I talked about by Bruce Catton. Uh, there's some pretty straightforward graphics here. Uh, number four at the top it says railroad mileage. Uh, 
Uh, you'll notice that the north has 20,000 miles worth of railroad up against 9,000 miles that the Confederacy is going to have. Manufacturing in terms of factories shows the Union with over 100,000 and the Confederacy with only 20,000. By sheer numbers alone, the North has the South whipped. The population of the North numbers about 18.5 million people, while the South is 5.5. The border states, which as we said are going to go either way, are 2.5 million with a furthermore 500,000 slaves. Um, the North is going to have this distinct advantage of, of not only population, but also um, you can see with corn and wheat and oats. You know, animals eat corn and wheat and oats. Um, the South agriculturally really only produces cotton and tobacco. I mean, rice is going to be you know a staple food. There's going to be a lot of a lot of calories in it. Um, but in terms of livestock, in terms of beef cattle, in terms of, of, of milch cows, those are cows that make dairy products, sheep, the, the union is going to have a distinct advantage. Um, not only just in terms of factories, but in terms of, of money as well. Uh, the United States starts off the war with $189 million to the South's $47 million. Uh, specie, that's in reference to gold and silver. Uh, the Confederacy only has 27 million versus the 45 million that the North has. Now, this is Tredgar Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia. Um, the significance of this particular place is that while it manufactured a lot of Confederate material during the war, it's the only iron works that the South had during the entire duration of the conflict. Uh, the North is going to have, you know, several dozen ironworks. They're going to have foundries. They're going to be, you know, cranking out locomotives and rifles and cannons and all sorts of material for the war. And the South, you know, from an industrial perspective, never really stands a chance. This cartoon is going to sort of show the futility of Jefferson Davis going up against Abraham Lincoln in the arena of war. Uh, you can see that, you know, gold from California, U.S. Treasury, what is that? You know, 500 million billion dollars that uh, Uncle Sam has, and uh, Jefferson Davis over there with the CSA Treasury. The sack's already busted open. Gold coins are flying across the floor. Uh, Uncurrencyed money over there underneath uh, his his feet. Uh, so the idea really is that the South can, in no way, shape, or form, really do anything uh, in regards to to having a fair fight against the North. What we're going to do now is take a look at two songs that were written by both the Confederacy and the Union, respectively. And what I kind of want you to do here is to pay attention to the lyrics and kind of think about the way that both sides are processing both their cause, you know, why they're fighting, and how they see the enemy. Our band of brothers and native to the soil, fighting for our liberty, famine, war, and toil. When our rights were threatened, the cry rose near and far. Hurrah for the bunny blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah, for solid rights, hurrah. We owe you Texas boys a debt of gratitude for putting on these shows. Crew back, any man, Kate Hagel, Pete Sorrow, Fiddle Ain't, Fibs of Curry, Mushroom. Now in northern treachery and tips our rights to par, we hoist on high the bunny blue flag that tears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah, for southern rights, hurrah, hurrah for the bunny blue flag that tears a single star. Here's to our confederacy, strong we are and brave. Like patriots of old, we'll fight our heritage to save. And rather than submit to shame, to die we would prefer. So cheer for the bloody blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah, for southern rights, hurrah. Sing 
how does the United States or the Union plan on ending the Civil War victoriously? This map shows a plan that was devised by General Winfield Scott, who by this time is a very old U.S. general. Uh, Winfield Scott had experience there in the Mexican-American War. Uh, well, this is going to basically be the Union strategy for the entire war. Um, the idea is that the United States Navy is going to blockade the southern ports so the Confederacy can't trade their cash crops like cotton and tobacco to Great Britain or France. So to cut off uh, the southern supply of money, how their whole economy works. Great Britain, in a lot of ways, is going to come off seeming like they're allied with the Confederacy. In fact, there's a really embarrassing incident where the United States Navy captures a Confederate ship and a lot of legal mumbo-jumbo transpires. Um, but the Confederacy really is going to have a hard time convincing Great Britain uh, to A, recognize them as a legitimate, as a real political power, um, or to offer them a great deal of money when it comes to building ships and all the other material that the Confederacy lacks to fight the war successfully. The second part of this whole strategy involves the Mississippi River. Now, I've always said, you know, we're doing our geography quizzes and whatnot, that we want to imagine that the Mississippi is, you know, cutting the United States in half, or not even the United States, the North American continent. Well, if the United States Navy can take New Orleans, if they can, you know, move up from the south and then, you know, move down from the north from St. Louis and all the rest, capturing Memphis and then, you know, meeting somewhere there in the middle of Mississippi, the state, um, that they can cut the Confederacy in two. And really, the, the idea of capturing the Mississippi and controlling it, its economic importance can't be misstated. Abraham Lincoln understood that. You know, when he was a young man, he took a trip with some livestock down to New Orleans, uh, where you know, we can assume that he witnessed his first experience with American slavery and how it appeared. Um, but you know, some major commercial artery. And if the North can control that, then there's not a lot that the South can deal with. The third part of General Winfield Scott's plan involves control of Tennessee. Uh, this state, you know, as we mentioned, is a border state, but it's also going to fall into the Confederacy. Um, Tennessee is really vulnerable, though, because it's accessible by two rivers called the Tennessee River and the Cumberland. And these are both very deep rivers that are going to essentially be highways by which the Union is going to invade. Under normal circumstances during this time of year, we'd be in the middle of chess club. And there's a really important strategy within the game of chess. Uh, you know, chess is, you know, 16 pieces a side, 64 spaces on the board. Um, and one of the ways that we talk about moves in chess has to deal with this, you know, this grid system. So this castle here at the bottom left, it's on square 1A. Um, and, and similar stuff. Well, anyways, let's go ahead and look at the middle of the board here. In chess, if you can control uh, D5 and E5 or D4, and e4 if you can control the middle of the board during a chess game there's a good chance that you can win uh, and the best way to think about tennessee is it's sort of the e4 the e5 of the chess board when we talk about the united states well besides controlling the mississippi river taking over tennessee uh, which is going to be in play throughout most of the war uh, there's this idea of a drive to richmond Richmond, Virginia has become the capital of the Confederacy. Uh, this capital city is only about 100 miles away from Washington, D.C. Richmond is going to be the primary Union objective of the war, and we're going to see its importance played out here as we discuss the Battle of Bull Run. So Abraham Lincoln is sworn in as President of the United States in March of 1861. In mid-April, there's going to be the Confederate attack on the Union Fort of uh, Fort Sumner down there in Charleston, South Carolina. And Lincoln is going to very quickly afterwards issue a call for 90-day volunteers. And so states all around the country are going to raise various you know, regiments and battalions, um, divisions, all that military lingo. Um, but these guys are going to rush to Washington, D.C. This is a really fascinating photograph from our country's history. Uh, these people all arrayed out in front of the White House are in fact citizens of Washington, D.C. who are pro-Union. Uh, 
you got to remember just across the Potomac River is Virginia. In fact, there's a really fascinating story about Robert E. Lee that's going to be played out later as we continue talking about this war. Um, but from Washington, D.C., from the White House, one could see the city of Alexandria, Virginia, right across the river. Virginia had formally entered into the Confederacy on May 23rd, 1861. So now there's a hostile state less than a 20-minute walk from the White House. Uh, the Confederate flag, that being the stars and bars, it's flying from within sight of the Capitol. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Elmer Ellsworth, and he is from Illinois, although not originally. Uh, he's 24 years old and was a close friend of Lincoln. Uh, he had studied law with him back in Springfield, and although he had little military experience, uh, he would help to drill the local militia and wore the uniform of the Zouave. Um, Zouaves were elite French soldiers who were considered to be amongst the best of the world here in 1861. Uh, they wore elaborate uniforms that were very colorful, uh, kind of what we would today call tacky or gaudy, uh, but this was really the fashion of the day on both the North and the South, on the Confederate and Union sides. Uh, there are going to be various soldiers, both as individuals and as you know, small groups as, as far as regiments are concerned, who are going to deck themselves out in these really colorful outfits. Um, you know, they kind of look like pirates. I don't know, kind of with these striped pants, um, these you know, tucked in shoes or boots. Uh, these are things called gaiters, uh, you know, but with a really pretty colorful um, you know, jacket and, and maybe a hat that's kind of like a uh, what's called a fez, you know, sort of a Middle Eastern look there. Uh, and there's a lot of different, you know, giddy-ups that these guys wear. But this was considered to be, you know, the elite um, fashion and, you know, the elite soldiers of the day. Well, let's get on here with Elmer Ellsworth. Well, the Confederate flag, as we said, was flying within sight of the capital of the United States. Colonel Elmer Ellsworth is going to lead his unit over the Potomac River and upon arriving in Alexandria, they're going to make it the goal to remove the flag that is flying from the roof of a hotel. So they're going to jot over to this building and take down the Confederate flag that's, that's fluttering in the breeze there. So he and his men uh, are going to go into the hotel. They're going to talk to a person that's staying there. And uh, they're going to go up to the top of the roof. They're going to cut down this really large Confederate flag. And now, as it turned out, the guy they talked to earlier on their way up to the roof was actually the owner of the hotel, and he is going to shoot and kill Ellsworth um, by a blast from his shotgun. And then the owner is shot in turn by one of Ellsworth's men, but regardless, Ellsworth is the first Union death of the war. In Abraham Lincoln's letter to Ellsworth's parents, it's going to demonstrate really the president's ability to think and convey uh, great emotion. My dear sir and madam, in the untimely loss of your noble son, our affliction here is scarcely less than your own. So much of promised youthfulness to one's country and of bright hopes for one's self and friends have rarely been so suddenly dashed as in his fall. In size, in years, and in youthful appearance, a boy only, his power to command men was surpassingly great. So Elmer Ellsworth becomes the first Union fatality of the war. A close friend to Lincoln and this, you know, and this ideal of a dashing young man. In a lot of the border states, like Maryland and in Missouri, uh, the federal government is going to take on uh, some pretty severe power. In fact, I'm no constitutional lawyer and I don't want to dive down this particular rabbit hole, term I use often, um, but the legal maneuvers that Abraham Lincoln has to undertake during this time to keep order, um, it, it's very unconstitutional. Uh, it comes down to a lot of things uh, that Lincoln will, will, will do and say, and, and the power of the federal government is going to be stretched immensely during the Civil War. And, you know, that's something to think critically about later in your studies. Um, it, it's definitely worth a look. You know, all things considered, I mean, this was the massive historical event of the day. Uh, the idea was preserving the United States. Let's go ahead and wrap things up by talking about the first major battle of the Civil War, and that being the Battle of Bull Run. 
which was fought on July 21st, 1861. So the first shots of the Civil War are fired in mid-April, and here we are in mid-July uh, with these volunteer amateur armies ready to roll out. Um, Washington, D.C. is only about 25 miles away from the battlefield of Bull Run, or the battle that the Confederates will call Manassas. Um, but there's a lot of fascinating stuff. Each side has about 35,000 men. Um, however, uh, only about half of those numbers are going to be engaged in the battle. Some important or fun facts to remember about the first major battle of the Civil War is that Bull Run is the first battle in human history where soldiers are transported to battle by the railroad. Um, it's not the first fighting. Um, the first fighting had actually taken place um, all along the entire boundary between the Confederate States and the Union. There was you know, shots fired in Missouri and Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, well, closer to Washington, D.C., there's this place called the Shenandoah Valley. And what the Confederates are going to be able to do is they're going to transport a good chunk of their army onto the battlefield of Bull Run uh, to reinforce their, their armies that are engaged. Pretty much everybody knows, um, both Confederate and Union, uh, that the, the Union Army is on the way to capture Richmond. A week before the Battle of Bull Run, Sullivan Ballou, a major in the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteers, wrote home to his wife in Smithfield. July the 14th, 1861, Washington, D.C. Dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow, and lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I am no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. And yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly with all those chains to the battlefield. The memory of all the blissful moments I have enjoyed with you come crowding over me. And I feel most deeply grateful to God and you that I've enjoyed them for so long. And how hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years when, God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and see our boys grown up to honorable manhood around us. If I do not return, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I loved you, nor that when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults, and the many pains I have caused you. How thoughtless, how foolish I have sometimes been. But oh, Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they love, I shall always be with you in the brightest day and the darkest night. Always. Always. And when the soft breeze fans your cheek, it shall be my breath, or the cool air, your throbbing temple. It shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone, and wait for me, for we shall meet again. Sullivan Ballou was killed a week later at the First Battle of Bull Run. The fighting that takes place 
is the culmination, meaning, you know, kind of the, the gathering of some maneuvers that both the Confederates and the Union carried out. Uh, on July 21st, really, it all comes to, to a head. Uh, the Union Army is going to clash with the Confederates. Uh, the Confederates, for a short time, seem like they've lost the initiative in the battle. Um, there's some legendary things that happen. Um, this guy is named Thomas Jackson. And Thomas Jackson had come from um, VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, where he was a professor. So you got to kind of remember these are our college kids that he's going to be commanding. Well, Thomas Jackson had brought his men onto the battlefield, and while other units are starting to run away uh, from the intense fire and starting to panic, one of the commanding officers of these fleeing units yells to his men, uh, you know, there stands Thomas Jackson's Virginians like a stone wall. And the nickname Stonewall is going to stick with Thomas Jackson. His unit is going to brace the Confederate line during this Union assault. Uh, and the Confederates are, are very quickly going to be able to take advantage uh, of, of the fact that the Union Army uh, is inexperienced. Well, the Union starts to retreat. We see in this painting uh, New York's WAV Regiment being overran by Confederate cavalry. Uh, there's all sorts of things that happen during this battle. Um, but the primary thing to remember is that the first Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, uh, really wasn't a true test of what either army was capable of. Uh, the Confederacy is going to claim victory, and, and rightfully so. However, they're not going to be able to follow up on any sort of um, action following it. The Union Army is going to be trapped on various roads and turnpikes leading away from the battlefield um, by a whole slew of civilians from Washington, D.C. who had come out with picnic baskets uh, to watch the Union Army whip the Confederates and go on to Richmond. Uh, so the Battle of Bull Run, the first major battle of the American Civil War, results in a Union defeat. However, all is not lost. Uh, McDowell, the commander of the Union Army, is going to be fired and replaced uh, by a guy by the name of George McClellan. And there's going to be some interesting and exciting stuff to talk about in our next installment.